This, this is the Our Auto Expert Podcast. Find us on air, online, on mobile, and on your smart speaker. Please subscribe at ourautoexpert.com. Our Auto Expert. 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 Now, here's the host of Our Auto Expert. Our Auto Expert. Nick Miles. Locally created, nationally celebrated from the northwest to the southeast. This is America's Car Radio Show. It's, if it has a throttle, by the way, we like to feature it on this show. On air, online, on mobile, or on your smart speaker. This is our auto expert. I'm your host, Nick Miles. Um, I sound a little bit like I should be doing voiceovers today for some big Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Uh, Megan and uh, Truck Girl Jen in the studio with us today. I just uh, I got sick on the plane back from Australia. Yep. Yeah, we so, can tell. Do I sound horrible? How long did it take you to get back from Australia? To like a month. Felt nah. Like, felt like a month. It took us 16 hours from... The one flight was 16 hours. So, Sydney to LAX? Uh, yeah. Yep. I did that with her. Uh, so I flew from uh, the Gold Coast to, uh, to Mel- uh, Sydney... Sydney to L.A. and L.A. to Portland, Oregon. That's half my life right there on a plane. You see, it, imagine all the things I could have done if I wasn't on a plane in my, my most of my life. <laughs> Australia was super interesting. Um, uh, everybody gets into the car on the wrong side because the steering wheel is on the other side. Did you know that I had to drive a manual when i was in australia with all three kids uh, judging me uh, well your kids are very judgy anyway. so you're on the wrong side of the road wrong side of the car and the manual's on the wrong side yeah it was brutal i almost many, stalled three times how many times did you use the windshield wipers instead of the indicator i don't think i had any issues with that oh everybody did really everybody kept turning the windshield wipers because you go for the wrong side you go to hit the indicator and it's like of the windshield wipers going and like ha ah, dumb person <laughs> But then I got in the driver's seat. I, I did it a bunch of times. So I was the dumb person. Well, when I was there, it was summer because I went in November. Right. Like late November. So right. I didn't need, I don't think it rained while we were there. We had one day. No, I don't know if we did have any rain. You know, the hardest thing for me was going around traffic circles. Oh, gosh. Because you go the wrong way. And most Americans have a hard time with traffic circles as it is, or roundabouts, as we like to call them, from, uh, if you're from a colonial country. Uh, but so, shouldn't that be easy for you? Yeah. Don't you have a lot of roundabouts in England? Yes, but remember, I've been driving on the other side of the road for 20 years. I was thinking the same Actually, thing. driving on the other side of the road isn't so bad. It's pretty easy. The hardest part is turning. Because when you turn... I have to think about it now. The steering wheel's on this. So when you turn... <laughs> wait... Wait, which side is the steering wheel? Yeah, so steering wheel's on the left. Well, yeah, because you're used so to when, gauging so, the width of the car. So, no, no, when you turn right, you're used to turning into the right-hand lane. But you don't. You go into the left-hand lane. And when you turn left, you're used to going in. It's the opposite way oh, around. Oh, yeah. And that's what gets you. It's turning and crossing the road. More people get killed. Oh, I shouldn't be talking about this. More people get killed crossing the road than they do in accidents from a foreign country because you look the wrong way for traffic. Yes, but in those people's defense... There's no defending getting killed. It's done. (laughs) Yes, but they're okay getting killed because... (laughs) Carry on. No, but did you see the statistics about people being run over because everyone's on their cell phones and everyone has headphones on? Like the statistics... It's like 10% more people are walking out into traffic and getting killed. Right. That's outrageous. Hey, welcome to the show, everybody. Um, (laughs) This... uh, When I go to cross the road, you're supposed to look... I have to look at the steering wheel in the car. You're supposed to look left and you look right. Is that right? Left, right, left. Yeah, I know, but people don't. And then I, Do I've you been... know how I can tell that you're jet lagged from Australia? Why? You still have the sticker on your cap. No, I left it on on purpose. Why? Until it gets... Because then I can tell how dirty it is. You by notice it says it's right. the casual That's ridiculous. cap. <laughs> I, did, I, did, like, I pulled the tags off. Mm. And then why do I have a cap on? Why do you have a cap on? Because I don't want to do my hair. <laughs> I'm lazy. I don't think I've ever seen that I have an before. Australian hat on because I didn't have to do wear a hat. I don't usually wear baseball hats, do I? Because I I'm, I'm an old man and I have long, flowing, beautiful hair. So you were on the Gold Coast? Gold Coast. No, Sunshine Coast. Oh, the Sunshine Coast. Sunshine Coast. Oh, okay. In Queensland? Yes. Okay. We, we went to Queensland once, but we right. went to a different part. It's beautiful. You know what? It is, Australia is like a mix, mixture of Mexico and England. 
Oh, I don't know. I would not say that. It's so definitely the, where I was. So the part that we were at, we were up in the Sundays, and we went out to this island called Whitehaven Beach. Right. And I have never seen anything like it before in my entire life. Uh, the, 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 it's probably the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Do you know that 70 people a week uh, overstay their visas? I would. In Australia. And it's a six-month visa. <laughs> 70 people a week overstay their six-month visa. Because they just don't want to leave. Yeah, it's just like, I'm, not, I'm staying here, mate. I'm not. I learned so much in Australia. Not, we're going to talk about trucks, the trucks I saw in Australia. Oh, I, I have heart palpitations because they have some beautiful trucks out there. But I learned, I'll just start you with kangaroos. I learned that, that kangaroos are almost blind, didn't know. You want to hear something horrible? No, let me finish. <laughs> kangaroos are almost blind. To, you killed one, didn't you? No, but we. No, don't. The, uh, <laughs> can, no, it, no, no. It. Oh, disgusting. We hand fed the, no. a kangaroo in the morning and ate it in the afternoon. You're, you're in that this. evening. We ate one. No, stop. Okay, isn't stop. This the car show. Yeah, stop. <laughs> I found out that kangaroos were uh, that when they have babies, which are called joeys, they can decide when they're born, because if the weather's not right and it's too rainy and stormy, they'll decide when it's born. Um, they can, if they have two young at once, they can decide which one gets the better strain of milk, even if they feed at the same time. All right. And they can decide what sex they have by looking at the herd and deciding if there's too many males or too many females, they can have the opposite. Can you imagine how much better the planet would be if we could do that with humans? I didn't know any of that. I just learned more about kangaroos than I did interacting with them. All right. You fed, I mean, you must've known they were almost blind. No, I had no idea. Yeah, they, we had to shake the bag next to them so they could so they could sense that we had food. No, the ones that we went to hopped right up to us yeah, and well, like they, ate right out of the kids' hands. Yeah, they ate out of my hands. And then they had corn in the food. They mixed corn in with it, and they eat the food and spit the corn out because they say corn helps them brush their teeth. That's why they give it to them because hmm. they don't like brushing their teeth. That's, that's so interesting. It's like, like we had being. two completely different experiences. Oh, and it's only a country that's the highest size of the United States. I'm sure there's lots of different experiences. Well, we were down on the Great Ocean Road, which uh, is it, a completely different area. It, let me just tell you, driving in Australia, amazing. And some of the vehicles they have there, I am. So, there's only one car factory left in Australia. And that changes Ram 1500s from the left-hand drive to right-hand drive. They come in left-hand drive, and they go out right-hand drive. Isn't that crazy? Did they used to have a lot of car factories? Yeah, there? lots. They had Holden, they had Toyota, they had a load of car factories. Well, you see a lot but, of Holden cars over there. Well, because that's what Vauxhall are. They, they are. That's what GM are. All GM cars are called Holden over there. Oh, I was trying to figure out which car brand that was. But let me just tell you, uh, I got to drive a car four months before it is even coming to the United States because they already have it in Australia. Really? We'll talk about that. We've got loads of other stuff. We'll tell you what's on the show coming up. You're listening to Our Auto Expert, our auto at expert.com. You're listening to Our Auto Expert. So busy talking about my uh, my trip to Australia, I didn't get to talk about um, what's on the show today. Uh, we will be talking in a moment to Simon Turner from Land Rover to help you discover new adventures in the 2020 Defender, which has finally been unveiled. I've been waiting for this vehicle since 1996, which was the last time that it was on sale in the United States. Jeff from Genesis will tell us why we need a G70 in our driveway. Uh, who was the 2019 winner of Run to the Sun? The SUV winner was the Alfa Romeo Stelvio. We'll get to talk to Ben Lyon about that and fresh take on the 2020 Lincoln Aviator that has just been launched. Eric Peterson joining us for that, plus Brian Armstead uh, talking about the new Audi A7. So there has been a frenzy. I went to um, New York Auto Show 2012 and got to drive the Defender Concept. I don't think it was actually called a Defender Concept at the time, uh, around a dock. And my favorite part was uh, the guy, the, the vehicle handler, Ian, would change gears for me by lying on the floor and uh, changing which gear I wanted to go into as I drove it around the dock in New York. The last time the Land Rover Defender was on sale in the United States was 1996. We've been waiting for it to come back. Um, Simon Turner is on the phone from Land Rover to talk to us about the new Defender. Uh, this is probably the most anticipated vehicle of the year, if not the decade, isn't it, Simon? Uh, absolutely, Nick. Yes, thanks for uh, having me on the show today. But it, absolutely, it's uh, it's long awaited. Um, probably the most significant launch for us in quite a few years. Do you think you're being judged harshly, or being judged fairly? Is everybody uh, sort of standing around making comments about something that's uh, been so much hard love work for you guys? 
<laughs> yeah, well, uh, it's always uh, a tough challenge to redesign uh, what effectively was an icon for us. The old defender was loved the world over, so it's a it's a tough task to redesign redesign it. But there's always uh, people uh, who uh, love it, hopefully, and a few a little uh, and not love it because it deviate it's deviated from what we uh, originally did, but. It's all good. We've had a fantastic reception for the car and uh, off to a really good start so far with it. So what, what's the Defender really famous for? Because in my eyes, this is the vehicle that the Queen drove herself across her estates. It's a vehicle that's uh, navigated many parties through Africa. It's been used on farms uh, around the world. It's used by the Italian police. It's sort of the go-to rough-and-ready uh, vehicle that can pretty much do anything and go anywhere. Is, is that the Defender of old? Absolutely. The new one will be no different to the old one. Well, it, it will be different in a couple of significant ways, which I'll talk, talk uh, about in a second. But uh, effectively, you're referring to its uh, uh, durability or dual purpose character. The new one will be exactly the same as the old one. It will still have that dual purpose character. And for us, uh, the Defender is really the foundation of the Land Rover brand. Everything that we have today in our portfolio of vehicles has evolved from effectively those original series Land Rovers, which then became Defenders um, in the middle of the last um, century. Um, so, um, you know, it's it's really significant. Um, it's probably the biggest departure, I, I should say, from the original vehicle is this vehicle will be very, very livable on a, um, a an everyday basis. The, the previous model, Defender, uh, was highly capable. Um, it was um, um, ladder on frame, chassis, um, uh, a body, I should say, I'm sorry. Highly capable, but um, it was a little uh, rough around the edges. That's part of what endeared it to a lot of people. Um, but the new one will be transformed. It will do all of the, or have all of the same capability, levels of capability that the previous model has or had but it will be livable on a daily basis. So you'll be able to drive it just like you drive uh, your other uh, uh, vehicles, SUVs and, and, and autos. So very livable. That's the main departure for this model. And uh, we've taken the opportunity to thoroughly modernize it, uh, update it with all the latest technology um, to make it uh, fit for the, for the modern day, as it were. My dad had a 110 when I was growing up, and it had the uh, the bench seats down the sides in the back. And we used to put a piece of plywood across them at night and just sleep in the back as a family. Um, which So I have great memories of this growing up, uh, traveling through Europe, through Italy, France, and Belgium, and Germany quite regularly as a kid. Will this be as usable as though the originals? Because you'll have two different, uh, you know, we had the 90 and then we had the 110 in the previous generation. Will it, will it have two different sizes in the new one? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And in fact, we've carried, uh, obviously, the names over. I think most people, well, some people probably realize that. So from a, from a character and a recognition standpoint, the, the old names have been used with the new models, but the, essentially the new models replicate the, uh, the two uh, previous ones as well. The 90 being the shorter wheelbase, that's really the what I would call a halo, halo for the for the capability aspect of Defender, that will be the most capable. Um, but the 110 equally, uh, or not far behind it, I should say, capability-wise. Yes, so you'll be able to put the seats down in the 110, uh, just like you've described, and uh, I, I dare say there'll be uh, some people that choose to sleep in the back from time to time as well uh, when it actually reaches our shores here and goes on sale. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about the uh, what what has changed on the new one. You say it'll be more more usability, more day to day, more something you can actually sort of sleep in and uh, something you can and drive to work every day. So it's, it will have that mixture. But but when we look at the vehicle, um, looking from the outside, it's taken quite a departure uh, from the original, but at the same time retains some of the original design characteristics. Yes, exactly, and that was very a very clear um, a task and challenge for the for design team. They wanted it to be fitting for the modern day, but they also wanted to respect the heritage heritage of the old model and and bring that forward into the new one. So some of the design cues, the the shot chopped off rear end, uh, the tail door uh, mounted spare, the alpine lights, 
and some of the uh, detailing at the front end very, very makes it very characterful and fitting with the old model. Some of those design cues carried straight over. Um, but just uh, to talk a little bit about the structure, the new structure, um, it's a, an aluminum intensive uh, body structure. Um, it is not ladder on frame. It has been developed from uh, a derivation of our uh, D7U uh, all aluminum architecture, which we've used for several years now on the other Land Rover, uh, Range Rover products and Discovery uh, Range Rover Sport, for instance. But it's taken that platform a step further so that it can deliver that capability story that really is the essence of what Defender is all about. So um, leveraging that and making it just fantastically capable was also another key focus uh, for the designers and the engineers as they worked on this. So D7X is the platform name for it. It's aluminum intensive, very, very strong but it's been optimized to give the new Defender uh, that capability and um, uh, go anywhere type of character that the old one was renowned for. Well, I think you've also sort of spiffed it up a little bit because I noticed it has things like a refrigerator in the center console and those type of things. So <laughs> the opportunity to uh, put some of the famous Land Rover luxury in there has not been uh, missed in a single step. Let's talk about pricing and availability. So. Do we know how much this new Defender is going to cost and when we are going to have the opportunity to drive it and buy it? Yeah, so um, the reveal was a couple of weeks ago in Frankfurt uh, in September. Uh, the vehicle will go on sale in the U.S. in the spring, uh, so March, April time frame. The starting price for um, the four-cylinder version, the 300 horsepower four-cylinder version, will be just a hair under 50,000, 49,900. And uh, the top of the range X model, uh, which has a, a, a more aggressive visual um, style and uh, more capability, the best capability that Defender can offer, tops out at around 80,900. So, and then there are models in between those two price points. So that's at 49.9 and tops out at 80,900. All right, Simon, can I put my order in right now? You can indeed. You do not need <laughs> another car. Yeah, I know I don't need another car. There was ever, never any need for any of the cars I own, but I definitely do want a, a Land Rover um, gorgeous. A, a Defender in my collection, the 2020 Defender. Simon Turner from Land Rover, thank you so much for joining us uh, today on Our Auto Expert. I assure you, I promise you, I mark my flag in the sand. I will own one of these. Of course you will. Thanks, Simon. <laughs> Uh, coming up, we've got loads more stuff on the show. We're going to talk Genesis G70 next on Our Auto Expert. You're listening to the Our Auto Expert podcast. Welcome back to the show. Now, if you have uh, needs in your life, you can catch up with previous episodes of the show at our website, ourautoexpert.com. You can hear all the past shows, see our automotive videos, and read insider car stories about your next ride. You'll find them all there at OurAutoExpert.com. Now, uh, I have several vehicles which are favorites of mine for uh, driving around and uh, enjoying. One of them happens to be the uh, Genesis G70. So we thought we'd have uh, Jeff on from Genesis to talk a little bit about the new G70. Uh, this is uh, what everyone's... Oh, no, it's that's the next segment. Why didn't anybody stop me when I got that far in? I don't have the schedule. Don't you? I have no idea what's happening. Right. Because I, I like the G70. It was a really nice Maybe vehicle, so I figured I'd just let you talk about it. I just see Dane in, in there shaking his head going, no, oh, I don't know what you're talking about, Nick. This is what happens when you get happed up on Advil and cough syrup. Yeah, he's a little weird Angel, today. Like, Jen's like, are you okay? I'm like, yes, I'm fine. <laughs> just, just on Advil and cough syrup. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about the Hyundai uh, Venue, which this is the car that was unveiled at the New York Auto Show. If you uh, you can bring pictures of up, up of it online, it looks like a very rugged off-road vehicle, uh, a little bit like it could be in the Jeep family. But at the same time, it's likely to be the least expensive Hyundai on the market. And it and in Australia, the reason that we went to Australia to test drive the new venue is that it's actually on sale four months in Australia before it's on sale in the United States. So I uh, was excited to go to Australia and drive it. And I have to tell you, they won't name pricing yet, 
But if you look at what Hyundai did with their Palisade, which is their three-row SUV, their Palisade is actually uh, pretty amazing because it's about ten to fifteen thousand dollars below the competition. So if we think the venue is going to be below the competition, uh, we're looking at maybe of a price between sixteen and nineteen thousand dollars on sale. Okay, so where would this fit in the lineup it's, after the Veloster and it, then it's. So if you look at the Elantra um, and the Kona, and then the they, they have it, it's based on one of their small cars, whereas the it's cute. the Kona it isn't isn't it? Look it's, at the front. It doesn't really it look cute. very rugged. For a little car, it sure does. At it, least it looks little. It is. I mean, it's fairly small um, as far as cars go. But if you look at if you look at uh, things like the Jeep Renegade and that type of thing. They look much, it looks much the same as sort of something might be a Jeep and an off-roader. It has those uh, cube-shaped uh, daytime running lights around the headlights. Uh, top, that, that's a daytime running light and a signal light as well. The headlights is actually lower down. It has that cascading grille. And below, on each side of the grille, those are actually uh, air curtains which direct the air around the wheel. Um, so you can uh, get it around the wheel. This vehicle has... F Pedestrian detection, full stop emergency braking. Um, it'll also have uh, an option of a denim two tone color. That's the dark blue and the white roof. So it'll have a two tone color. It has every single one of them gets an eight inch touch screen. So it's not like only the top trim levels get a really nice touch screen. Uh, then, then you, when you go to buy the one that you want, it has like a four-inch screen in the middle of the dash. Now they all have those eight-inch screen. Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, uh, Blue Link as well from them. And it was—it's actually really easy to drive and position. Is it going to have heads-up display? Uh, I don't know. I don't. I uh, love that feature. Heads-up display. Mm -hmm. See, some people absolutely hate heads-up display. Megan, do you hate heads-up display? No, I like it. You I do? like it when it tells me the speed limit. Mm -hmm. The speed limit's good if it has inter interaction of a speed limit. Um, and it, it's also heads-up display stops you looking down uh, at your gauges constantly, right. and you're able to look at uh, the road. Some of the new, uh, for instance, in the Hyundai Palisade, the heads-up display that they have in that will actually um, tell you when there's an incoming phone call and who's calling. Their little picture of them can hop up into the heads-up display. Oh, that's cool. I think that's pretty brilliant. Yeah, um, keep your eyes up. <clears throat> yeah, then, then I, I want to be able to write on them, like, you know, sort of cross them out. No, don't have them call me again. No, it's going to have smart yeah. sense, too, as well, with the driver, driver attention warning. Yes, um, and it went off, actually. Well, I was uh, with Andre from the fast lane truck, TFL truck, and uh, Andre... Uh, it, it came up on him. It said, you know, you need to start paying more attention to the road and you need to take a break. I love it when it does it to someone else. I hate it when it does it to me. <laughs> well, what were you doing when it said that? I don't think anything in particular. Like, it, it obviously reads all the signs and then decides. He was, we were chatting away and talking. I know that it notices if you turn your head away from the screen enough times, then it'll start uh, getting you, like telling you you're not looking at the road enough, maybe you're tired. So it's got a camera watching you? Yeah, you, most of them usually have infrared mm -hmm. cameras to watch you. Megan, they're watching you even while you drive. <laughs> you, know, you know how I feel about that. Yeah. That's not right. The 2007 uh, minivan doesn't have that. Coming up, we'll talk to Jeff about the G70, plus a bunch more stuff on our Auto Expert as the show continues. You're listening to our Auto Expert. On Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram, start a conversation with us. We will be happy to, uh, to have a conversation with you. Megan, what have you been up to? I have you been actually... driving anything cool? Well, once again, I found myself in the Chrysler Pacifica. I road tripped all over Montana in it, and... It's a mommy van, isn't it? It is, and I was like, really? Really, y'all? You got me a minivan? <laughs> Are you going to put that up on uh, mommytravels.net? Yeah, I'll be talking a lot about Montana up on Mommy Travels. And uh, it was a really cool trip. It turns out that a, so part of Yellowstone is in Montana. And West Yellowstone, which is one of the entrances into Yellowstone, is Montana. So I got to see a, uh, quite a bit of Yellowstone. I got to eat lots of amazing food. It turns out people in Montana eat like Texans. So that was, I had fried oh, okra. Here we go. <laughs> I had fried pickles. Oh. <laughs> I know. I work Texas into every show. I'm sorry. But yeah, it was, I mean, there were three adults. There were three of us in the Chrysler Pacifica. And you know what? It, it's just roomy. I mean, as much as I want to hate a minivan, gosh dang, it's so convenient. You know what I don't instead of a Chrysler Pacifica? A Genesis G70. 
mm. North American Car of the Year. Yes. Uh, on, joining us on the phone is Jeff, my friend Jeff from Genesis, to talk about the G70. Um, you guys, it, this is still your year, isn't it, Jeff? You're still, uh, you're still Car of the Year up until the end of December. Yeah, good morning, Nick. Uh, it's, uh, it's definitely the year for Genesis. Um, G70 is, a, is a, just such a fantastic car. And yeah, I'm lucky to, lucky to receive award after award for it. You do, have you had to build a new awards cabinet? Because I uh, I just Googled it before we came on, and it's like, oh, it won this, and it won that. And it was just like North American Car of the Year was kind of the beginning. Yeah, I think that our last count, uh, and, and um, I, my, my count is, is pretty up-to-date, uh, is about 20 to 22 awards uh, for G70 in the first year alone. So um, it's not as much a cabinet as it is um, like a man cave. For a <laughs> a What's man the cave. Uh, most unusual award it's won? You're making Jeff think. I'm sorry? What was the most unusual award you think it's won, Jeff? The most, you know, it's so interesting. I wouldn't call it unusual, but it would, I would call it unexpected. Uh, in, in the same span of about a month, G70 was awarded best winter car by the North, uh, the, I'm sorry, the New England Motor Press Association and Best Panoramic Sunroof uh, by the Southern Automotive um, Media Association. <laughs> you're so it's a car really for all seasons. <laughs> wow. You're, you're, you're loving America equally state by state. There you go. <laughs> uh, so let's, let's start at the beginning. Genesis is kind of the luxury arm of Hyundai, right? Well, it's interesting, Nick. At this point, Genesis is... Um, we're a fully separate brand, uh, and uh, the company with, with three models, what began you know, as, as a, an experiment into the luxury market um, almost a decade ago, now there are three Genesis models, G70, G80, and G90. So um, we, we receive a lot of support from a very, very um, generous mother company that, that provides uh, technical support, and, um, but Genesis is its own entity. Okay, so it's it's a it's its own company, and you the three sedans that you have out are just the beginning because you have shown a bunch of things like uh, you had Mint at the New York Auto Show, which is this sort of small electric city car. You've shown uh, some concept uh, cars, which are bigger SUVs. It looks like the the brand is getting ready to explode. You are you've been paying attention. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's, uh... <laughs> the the sedans that we have on sale right now really are just the beginning, um, and and I, I'll I'll talk. But yeah, Genesis, um, which which is now in its is approaching its fourth year, uh, has spent some time uh, gathering support in a lot of the traditional segments for for luxury, um, and we we think that G70, G80, and G90 um, are at the top of the class, uh, and now as we move into what we call the second chapter or, or the next evolution of the brand, we will start uh, moving into some new segments. Um, and we can talk about those if you want. The, um, the mid concept that you mentioned from New York, uh, it was what we like to call it um, an electric car for the city. Um, and it's a, it's a concept for urban mobility that has a low footprint, a low carbon footprint, and then also very small footprint in general. So, so with those types of ideas, Genesis is going to be moving uh, further from the traditional and more into the unexpected, but, but quite delightful. But with the G70, you did some things that were pretty, un, you know, non-traditional too. I mean, you put a manual in it, which not many luxury car makers do. You put a two-liter engine in it. You gave it both uh, rear wheel and all-wheel drive, and it doesn't seem that most manufacturers don't mix them. They do either one or the other. Um, so you decided to play almost in every field that you could play in. That is the approach. We wanted to make sure that uh, that G70 in particular, which we know is a great driver's car and, and something that, that the second you drive it, you understand. Um, and we've, we've given it a number of flavors. So there's the, that same the same basic uh, level of um, of engineering that that is you know at the top of its class that we that we bake into every single G70, and then. Uh, you can order it with the turbo four cylinder and the manual transmission, or um, all the way up to the 3.3 twin turbo V6 with um, with a silky eight speed automatic. And, and and it has launch control. Yeah, I mean launch. Yeah, I, so, so you, you you've been paying attention also. Of course, <laughs> I love this car. I had a really good time in it at Renda the Sun. So yeah. Oh. 
wasn't it fantastic? It, well, did, did you get to try out um, launch control while, while we were up there? No, unfortunately. <laughs> launch control? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. yeah, zero to 60 in 4.5 seconds. Ooh, baby. <laughs> the, big, the biggest problem but when... There wasn't, there wasn't somebody in the right seat who was saying no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the biggest problem when you have launch control and 24 other journalists there, yeah. that the second that you use it, every other journalist wants to have a go too. Mm-hmm. So you kind of get a cascading effect on. You've got to be, it's like doing burnouts. The second you do one, everybody wants to try doing a burnout. Well, it's got torque vectoring controls too, so it handled really well around the curves. And I mean, we had some pretty good driving routes as well, didn't we, Jeff? Yeah. I, yeah, and I, I didn't realize it until I, I saw a summary, but it looks like we covered over 450 miles in, in a very short amount of time. That's why you need to take the rest of the week off when you've done uh, the, the run to the sun. <laughs> Uh, so the, now the G70, and we would be amiss if we didn't talk about her, Albert Biermann, who came from the BMW M Group and uh, was responsible for tuning their vehicles. He's now tuning Genesis, too. Yes, we are very, very lucky to have the support of someone who understands how a performance car should, should feel and should be driven um, at, at the helm and really pushing the design and engineering forward for all these cars. So, so yes, G70 received Mr. Bierman's final stamp of approval, um, and um, there are some legends about um, a secret road up in Korea, uh, just outside of Seoul, where he would go on the weekends um, with his wife, or, or you know, or, or, you know, or perhaps by himself, um, to do some final validation tuning on G70, and um, and the car that you drive is a result of of his time and his effort and then you know him guiding the team so that g70 would be a true driver's car something that could go up against any established sports sedan you know the interesting thing about it is too i got to talk to albert when we were in new hampshire uh, for the test drive of the g70 and one of the things that he said is and he's very hum he's a humble man which i found very interesting this guy is known for tuning these cars and uh, helping model how they feel to every driver on the road he said he didn't want to take responsibility for any of the engineering he really wanted to make sure that the Korean engineers who had designed the car got their um, got their award. Uh, he said he was just responsible for taking a great piece of engineering and making it even greater by deciding how it was tuned. And that really surprised me with him. He was very, very humble. Yes. Um, I mean, that, that's something that you'll find that it's a feeling that permeates throughout the Genesis brand where there's a, a level of of uh, being humble, uh, and, but but also understanding that you're creating the best product, um, and the reason, the same reason that um, that Mr. Bierman joined Genesis was to really up the game from from the start. So if G70 is this good, we we we've set ourselves a pretty high benchmark going forward. Now, when is uh, when is Genesis going to make a manual uh, uh, wagon uh, diesel version of this? <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> that's like Nick's uh, well, fantasy uh, over there. It's like it's got to be a like, wagon. It's like it's every be a every, every auto journalist wants a diesel manual wagon. No, just that's you. Just not true. <laughs> it's just auto, Nick. Real auto journalist wants a Ooh. diesel manual wagon. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, Price. Price point on this is pretty yeah well so pretty so let's reasonable. talk about about how much these vehicles are and um, from starting at the lowest price to uh, if you were to fully equip it with that twin turbo. Sure. Um, it starts at thirty-four thousand nine hundred dollars, which, um, at you know, no matter how you look at it, is extraordinary value. Um, but what we like to mention, and this is something that you don't also necessarily know until you go to a, uh, to a retailer, is the fact that with that price, whether you're buying a G70 at thirty-five thousand dollars or one that's fully equipped closer to fifty-two thousand um, dollars, you get service valet included. Um, and this is if you have any any kind of interruptions to your schedule or, or your life is busy or you travel for work, um, having service valet, which is a service that Genesis offers on every single vehicle um, where when, when your car needs service, they will come pick your car up. Uh, Genesis will come pick your car up and during service will leave you with another vehicle. So you have another car to drive the entire time. And then when service is completed and your car is, is back and it's clean and it's washed, they come back and you have not visited the dealership. You haven't visited the service department. Everything is just done for you. And this, Nick, this is the, the extraordinary part of the value equation. 
it's it's available at, on every single model that Genesis sells um, at, at any price point. And do people take advantage of this, or is it just used as a as a sort of safety net? Because often these programs are really uh, make people feel comfortable. It's like having all wheel drive in a vehicle, so they could use it. Do people actually use that, or or is it something that's just as a safety net? No, um, it, it's it's quite heavily used. Um, in my last conversations with um, uh, with the people at the office about this, um, it, the take rate is about is over seventy five percent which means three out of four drivers have not been back to a showroom or a service center since they signed the paperwork. Wow. Uh, um, that's pretty amazing, too. The uh, So now the G70, you said, was one of three models. So just, just run us in the last two minutes that we have, run us through uh, the other two models that you have available today. Can I can I tell you a secret? Yes. I, I, yes. I want to talk about... <laughs> I want to talk about... When an automaker <laughs> says, can I tell you a secret, we're always going to say yes. Uh, and, and, and this is just between us. Uh-huh. Uh, but I, I want to tell you about my favorite Genesis uh, model that, that people aren't really talking about. Um, but it's the G80, which is the, um, the mid-size luxury sedan with the 5-liter V8. Ooh, um, now you're you can... talking my language. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just I just spent uh, nearly three weeks driving one, and it's just, uh, it, it, it eats up the miles. Um, and it's it's basically this like this the secret sauce is the V8. It's uh, it's not a turbo V8, but it has 420 horsepower. Uh, it's rear wheel drive or all wheel drive with paddle shifters. Um, it's you you never you're never uh, struggling for power, um, but at the same time it's this kind of like luxurious and quiet cocoon. Um, you turn up the sound system, the Lexicon 17 speaker sound system, and you're just as isolated as you want from traffic, but so connected to the road. So um, as, as exciting as G70 is to drive around a curve, um, you, you can literally eat up highway miles. Um, I, I did hundreds of miles at a time driving that G80. Oh, you, you, you've wet our appetite, uh, Jeff. Of course, you can find out more at uh, Genesis website. And Jeff, it's always amazing to have you on the show. You're a good fun uh, you're a guy with loads of information. And I look forward to uh, my uh, year long term loan of the G70, which I know is on the way to my house <laughs> as we speak. Jeff, thanks. We'll have you on again soon. We've got a packed show. You're listening to the R Auto Expert Podcast. You've heard us talk about the uh, Northwest Automotive Press Association's Run to the Sun. It's 24 vehicles, 24 journalists. We're going to drive the roads of Oregon and Washington and test each vehicle. About every 20 miles, uh, we swap vehicles and you get into a different one. There are a bunch of categories. There's coupes, there is four-door sedans, there is convertibles, and there is SUVs. And they're all, the only um, mantra is they have to be performance uh, vehicles in those categories and uh, interestingly one of the vehicles that has usually the uh, automakers want to enter new vehicles that just came out into uh, their as their category or as the vehicle they enter into their category they want them to have been out just a few years a few weeks or months uh, but one of the vehicles that came back for a second time was the new um, Alfa Romeo Stelvio uh, Quattrofolio and uh, Ben Lyon is on the phone from Alfa Romeo because, Ben, you took away the grand prize. You were the SUV um, of the year, or the performance SUV of the year for the Northwest Automotive Press Association. But this vehicle has been getting uh, a lot of awards when it uh, shows up anywhere, doesn't it? Yeah, it sure does, Nick. And, and you know, it's, uh, we're, we're always obviously delighted when we, uh, we win another award. If we look at what we've won since uh, we came back to the north american market here relaunched in 2014 over 225 awards won globally uh for, for our 4c uh alfa romeo julia and stelvio products and uh the one with the run to the sun here that we just want for most fun was uh a, a, another great win as well so let's talk a little bit about the vehicle first of all stelvio it was uh, its name comes from the stelvio pass it does. Um, a long, winding stretch um, of winding roads in Italy, in the Italian Alps there. Uh, you know, 30 or 40 switchback turns over 12 miles of, of route, and it's just the perfect name uh, for the vehicle because it has roots in, it, uh, in Italy, of course, but it also has, you know, what it takes c- to compete on that and other winding roads. It's a very dynamic, fast, well-balanced 
uh, vehicle and a, a performance machine to be sure. It, it's starting price is around forty thousand dollars, but there are uh, v- different variants you can buy of the vehicle from around two hundred and eighty horsepower up to uh, the Quattrofolio, which is five hundred and five. Is is are they all sort of bought equally by customers, or does everybody go for the big five hundred and five horsepower? Well, so we have about a 10% mix of what we sell. Uh, it varies by month, but on average, it's right around 10%, which is uh, a higher percentage than what we had actually forecasted. When we, uh, we came out with the quadrifolio version of the Selvio, it was, uh, it really took the, took the media and our consumers by storm. And so, um, yeah, many of them are flocking to it, but our, you know, obviously our bread and butter is with that two liter, um, standard 280 horsepower, uh, best in class horsepower and torque from a standard configuration. Zero to sixty is the best in its class, and it, you know it looks the part of that of that quadrifolio performance model as well. It too is a performance vehicle. You don't have to pony up the uh, and walk up the trims and pony up the cash to get a vehicle that looks and performs from a performance standpoint from a uh, SUV. So uh, it's something we're proud of as well. Now, how many people have a hard time uh, st- finding the start button on this vehicle? <laughs> You'd be surprised. Uh, when I get in cars and, and, and say, have you driven a Stelvio? Have you driven an Alfa Romeo recently? And they, many, some will say no, it will be the first time. And they're looking around, they're looking for the push button start on the console and all over up down. It's on the steering wheel. It's, uh, it's a flat bottom steering wheel that's an F1 racing inspired wheel. Uh, very tight uh, diameter from a turning radius and also a, a steering ratio. But, yeah, we have that uh, that red start button right there down there, just like they do on the F1 truck on our Silvia. And people don't accidentally turn it off? No, I've never, I've never heard of it. Uh, it actually has a – we designed it as such that the, the force that you have to push down to depress it is such that you don't accidentally hit it. Yeah, ah, okay. it's not just a bump and turn off the car in the middle of a cornering somewhere on a – windy road uh this, this vehicle itself what do you think the that makes it stand out from other suvs that are on the market well two things nick uh, first of all it looks unlike anything else on the road their signature v scudetto grill it's a v-shaped grill that's flanked by two lower air outlets or air inlets i should say that we what we call the tree lobo so um, a, a three-part design element and something that we've been using on our vehicles for over 75 years so that when you see it, it not only looks different, but you also know this is an Alfa Romeo. Um, second to that is the way it drives. It is, you have to experience it to know what I'm talking about, but you can get in competitive vehicles that are SUVs as well, and they're very good products, but nothing quite handles like a, a Stelvio. It has a near perfect 50-50 weight distribution. Um, it has a sport tuned suspension, and it just feels like it is just glued to the road. And so that performance element and the way you feel it when you drive it dynamically is something that stands out from completely from our competition. So now you have several trim levels available in this vehicle as well. I know you introduced one uh, at a recent auto show, which was the Nürburgring version, the N version, and then you also have the uh, Nero Endiziano in the um, uh, Italian thing. <laughs> <laughs> Nero is... Nero Edizione, which means black package in Italian. And so what, what you get there are some uh, dark 20-inch wheels. You also get a dark grill, rear caps, badging, rear fascia element, and a couple other uh, uh, design cues as well. It really gives it that contrast and uh, kind of darkens the, the vehicle down a little bit to give it a more uh, a more sinister look. But, yeah, in addition to that, we, we have the uh, the Enver vehicles. We made uh, 55 of each vehicle, the Julia and the Stelvio Quadrifolio, to commemorate the time when we set the record on the uh, Nürburgring track. And it's a, it's a very exclusive car, numbered, uh, badged with uh, matte gray paint on the exterior, and it's a very exclusive and rare car, one that's sure to be a, a collector's edition. I really like blacked-out looking car. I like to my vehicles to look menacing and, you know, dangerous. Cause I I'm, do too. Because I'm not, so I like the car to look at least like that. So when I come up in somebody's rear view mirror... You know, it always makes me feel good about it. It's like get out of my way. All right. Yeah. Uh, ben, how do we how do we find out more about the Alfa Romeo Stelvio? Sure. Uh, obviously, uh, Alfa Romeo USA dot com uh, with our new uh, vehicle configuration page and landing page, um, as well as the build and price uh, element on there. You can find the dealers near you and, and search inventory as well at again Alfa Romeo USA dot com. 
I love it, and uh, they are such a pleasure to ride. Ben Lyon, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, you can find out more about that car at uh, ourautoexpert.com as well. Uh, coming up, we're still going to talk about the Lincoln Aviator. This vehicle is Lincoln's uh, latest to go on sale. They're building out to have six SUVs in their lineup, and this one will even judge whether a pothole is coming up. You're listening to Our Auto Expert. Welcome back to the show. If you uh, want to listen to previous episodes of the show, you can always do that and catch up with those episodes at our website, ourautoexpert.com. Also see some of our automotive videos from television stations around the United States and read insider car stories about your next ride. You'll find it all at ourautoexpert.com. Now, recently I headed to Napa Valley to drive uh, the Lincoln Aviator and this is an interesting vehicle originally revealed uh, at a New York auto show I believe it was we got to look around see the vehicle and this was quite a departure from um, things that Lincoln have done they've always just had uh, basically the Navigator and a splattering of cars uh, but this is a full force SUV that they've come out with and it uh, follows the the Navigator in sort of all those luxury and beautiful interiors that Lincoln have become famous for uh, so we thought we'd invite Eric Peterson on to the show to talk a little bit about the new Aviator and Eric uh, after driving it uh, it's definitely on my list of cars I want to take home <laughs> Sounds like a wonderful list, if you ask me. Right. Uh, the, the the Aviator is, so it's smaller than the Navigator, uh, but this vehicle is actually uh, sort of made for family everyday use as well. Plenty of room and plenty of things like charging ports and the things that a family might need on top of all that Lincoln luxury. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's, we're, we're really excited to bring it to market because you, you mentioned that, you know, we've got a Navigator, which so many people are familiar with, and it's been just a home run and re- helping us redefine the Lincoln brand. But for some people, it was just, you know, it's a little, it's a little too big. And the Nautilus, which is the, you know, the, the two row vehicle that would be you know, right below it in terms of size, just didn't have that third row. So this is that, that, that perfect option that needs the third row that needs to carry some people around more than just the two in the front seat or even that, that third, that occasional time when you've got a family you need to haul around or a, or a couple of extra friends in the back. It's got all the room. All the amenities, it's just a, it's a perfect vehicle. And like I can attest to right now, as I'm driving the Aviator, uh, when it's just you behind the wheel, it's, it's amazing. Now, the, the Aviator comes with a lot of um, safety features and convenience features. Let's start yeah. off talking about the Copilot 360 Plus. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a comprehensive suite of technology that we have on the vehicle. And it really, um, it, it's meant to, you know, not only you know, protect you from a safety perspective, but also just really keep, keep you informed. 360-degree camera, um, warning for front and warning for, warning for back, and um, even some of the more advanced features like a, like a heads-up display that then will afford you the opportunity to, to keep everything right in front of you, all meant to keep your hands on the wheel and, uh, and eyes on the road. Now, we hear about something called Traffic Jam Assist, Adaptive Cruise Control with Traffic Jam Assist. Um, how, how does this vehicle assist you during a traffic jam? Well, I mean, it, it's, it's, what's, what makes it spectacular is that that technology provides that, that stop and go feature. So you can, you can set the, the, the kind of start and stop or set uh, the, the Traffic Jam Assist, and it'll, it'll slow you down when the cars are slowed down in front of you, and then speed you right back up to catch up to traffic. And really, it's it's all meant to have this this feeling that when you're in a Lincoln, you know, you're in complete control, you're in complete command, that you're as stress free a driving as, as possible, and it's even in a traffic jam or or uh, when you're in the open road. Now, this car can also help you uh, with maybe not getting a speeding ticket, right? <laughs> you got that right. I mean, there's there's a there's a warning like on my heads up display, for example. It'll have the posted posted street speed. So uh, right now I'm driving a safe 70 when the, when the speed limit says 70 right next to it. So it's perfect. Um, it's got all those features for, to recognize the sign on the road. So technology, not just for technology's sake, technology that's purposeful to make your driving experience just a little bit richer. And Jan was just saying before we got on the air today that she really likes heads-up display I when do. they have the speed signs uh, displayed. Because yeah. some, sometimes you'll turn onto a road and you have no idea. 
and me going a little faster than probably normal people <laughs> could get myself into trouble. Well, you, 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 you hit it right on. I mean, it's it, and it's it's those little touches. I mean, the engineers have just done a remarkable job of it with this vehicle. Everything from the way it feels when you're driving to those technology bits, just like that. And it's not like I said, it's not just technology for technology. They put in that speed limit sign right next to the actual you know speedometer. It's perfect. You know exactly what what you should be driving and. If you choose not to not to listen to it, well, that's on you. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the actual design of the vehicle as well. Um, I know that when we walked through uh, the original launch, that we looked at some old planes and uh, some ideas that these this vehicle was actually designed with sort of the flight in motion uh, idea. So it, it intentionally looks like it's a, a vehicle that is actually moving while standing still. Yeah, I, it's, I mean, the, the inspiration was clear when we decided to, to, to name it Aviator, but even before that, it was one of the things that the designers looked at for, for cues from, you know, bomber jackets for the leather to, you know, watches and dials, and, and, and then also the slope and the, and the, the look of, you know, you know aeronautic-type type things to make sure that this could be a, a really, you know, aviation-themed vehicle, and you feel it. You, you feel it when you look at it with the kind of, you know, with, the, with the lines on the side and the slope back over the third row, it just has this 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 feeling that, that when you get into it, you're going to glide like you're in an airplane. And that was one of the uh, the design attempts from the engineers when they started with this, and they nailed it. And you feel it when you get in the vehicle too. You kind of feel like you're in a first class cabin. So it's a it's a air, aeronautical theme all the way around. I will tell you, it's very rarely that I come across a car where I tell you I like to drive the hybrid version better than the gas version because I'm a bit of a petrol head. But that is the case with this Aviator because the hybrid version, when you combine it with that twin turbo, uh, it pushes the horsepower almost to, uh, to, is it 500? Almost 500. Yeah, 494 to be exact. And it, you're, you're right. It's, it's hybrid when you need it, but it gives you that other, that boost that, that really makes driving fun um, when you, when you want to get into it. So it's, it's the best of both worlds, that's for sure. Jen's shaking her head at me right now. She's like, almost 500 out of a I'm hybrid. Like, what? <laughs> well, yeah. It, it is a bit head turning. You're right about that. I mean, you think about a, a three row SUV that can give you that kind of horsepower. It's a. It's not just something to to move people around, and it's something when it's just you in the front seat. You you feel it underneath you, and it's a it's a rewarding experience for sure. Now, Lincoln have become famous, um, Eric, for, for a couple of things, but one of the things they've started to become famous for is their, their pickup and delivery options and some of their concierge options. Yeah, it, that, and, that's, and that's purposeful. I mean, we think that the buying experience and the, the ownership experience goes way beyond the moment when you, when you purchase a vehicle, in particular for a luxury car and a luxury brand. And so a feature like pickup and delivery it's just a it's a way to be you know more you know more respectful of everybody's time and make your make your experience with the Lincoln brand just a little bit easier so if and when you need service or something simple as an oil change you just um, you make the appointment on your app or you can call the dealer and, and arrange it and uh, they'll come pick your car up take it in for service and bring it back to you again it's it's effortless for you and it, it, it's meant to be something that um, really kind of enhances that 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 experience that you really can only get from being part of the Lincoln brand. And if, if having a Lincoln badge on your car wasn't enough for you, you kind of upped the game a bit by introducing the black label. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, exactly. We, we thought that that was important, too, because there's always a, you know, there's a, there's this, you always want, people want the latest technology, et cetera. But with black label, it afforded us this opportunity to just put all of the absolute finest things into, into a package to, to create, you know, a, a, the most luxurious experience you can get out of a out of a out of a luxury vehicle, and it's rewarding from the leathers to the technologies to the headliner. It's just it's a remarkable experience, and you you definitely feel first class when you're in a black label Lincoln. So now, you, you know, Lincoln have slated um, the obviously we know about the concierge. Um, mm-hmm. That's coming. I'm actually, I'm going to go drive that Monday. Uh, you have a bunch of other vehicles slated for release or uh, uh, stuff that's sort of rumored about. But uh, right now, on sale is the uh, in the SUV department is the Navigator and the Aviator. Is the Aviator all available to be purchased today? It, it is, as a matter of fact. Yeah, we've we've been um, we've been having them available for sale for about the last thirty forty five days. So um, they are arriving and continuing to you know, sl- slowly grow stock at our at our dealership, and uh, it's exciting. I mean, Aviator is the 
the product that we've been waiting for, and uh, we're glad that it's in our showroom. Eric, thanks so much. Maybe we'll have you back on to talk about the next one that I drive tomorrow. Yeah, Eric. Have, a, have a great time in California. I will do. Thanks, Eric. Eric Peterson from Lincoln. And coming up, we're going to talk a little bit more about driving on the wrong side of the road in Australia. You're listening to the Our Auto Expert Podcast. Welcome back to Our Auto Expert. Uh, if you... Uh, ever have that thing to listen to a really good podcast you can go to our Podbean account or uh, listen to all the previous shows they're all there or go to ourautoexpert.com at ourautoexpert.com you will of course find all of uh, our TV segments from around the country and the uh, great articles that the team at Our Auto Expert write Um, now I know that we've talked a little bit about uh, Australia and the fact that I got to drive on the wrong side of the road but at the same time, they have some awesome vehicles in Australia that we don't get here. There's lots of trucks. You know, there's, so first of all, some facts about Australia. It's as big as the uh, continental United States, not if you don't include Alaska and uh, Hawaii. That's the size of uh, the whole of Australia. And most of the population, 90% of the population, live just 50 kilometers from the sea. So most of the people are all around the edge of because inside it's a big burning rock. I mean, basically, Australia is beautiful <laughs> around the coast, and then this like big sizzling mass of billions of degrees in the middle. I mean, it's true though. We flew from Whit Sundays to Melbourne, so from the top to bottom, essentially, more or less. There's just nothing. It is. It's just a big. big I looked rock. out the window for hours. It, it just nothing. Right. But getting to Australia, what was really worrying me was flying across. You fly across ocean all of the way. You sort of head out into the ocean and from that LA. You? Yeah, because. Well, how do you think you get to England, Nick? Well, you don't. You don't go across ocean to England. You go up over the top of the earth. <laughs> you go over the North Pole, and then there's little bits of ocean, but not 16 hours of ocean. <laughs> well, aren't you going to Japan? Yeah, it's the same it's the way. Same way. <laughs> it is. It, is. it just bothers me if you're going to come down in the middle of the ocean. No one's ever going to find you in a ship because if it's a 16-hour flight and you go down about eight hours into the flight, what's the chances just, of a ship just cruising? Just go the same? at night and go to sleep, and then you can't, you can't see anything anyway. Well, you know, actually, we did leave at 11 p.m. Yeah, and then we arrived at 7 a.m. when we got into Sydney. It's funny because it, on the plane it tells you what times, where, what the local time is, where you're flying above, and it was always like two something a.m. <laughs> and it never stopped until you get to a certain point, and then it goes three, four, five, six. That's it's kind of interesting. So you're flying into no What did you think so. about uh, being in the future? Yeah, that's it. I called home and talked to my uh, lovely spouse and said, hey, I'm calling you from the future because we were a day ahead. <laughs> and it was like, don't be stupid. Don't call me from the future. If only you had the lottery numbers. Right. I wonder if you could get the lottery numbers in Australia when they'd won and then buy a ticket Oh, Sadly, that's boy. not how time works. No. Oh, Good damn try. it. <laughs> uh, but they have a lot of interesting Mazda trucks out there, and they all have these snorkels that go up. And I was like, well, because they do a lot of – no, it's because the dust. Um, so apparently that most of the roads, over 50% of the roads in Australia are gravel roads, and that gravel gets in your air filter and it sucks it in. So they have the snorkels on all the vehicles. Even like a well, regular Toyota. family sedan, they have the dust snorkels. You know TRD what? has that. I have always wondered what that was for. I know. I just told you. It's for <laughs> dust. You could have called. Yeah, because there's so much dust when you drive these vehicles that they have a snorkel up there so it doesn't get into your car, into the engine. That's funny, though. I didn't see any of those when I was in Australia, but we were in cities. so. Right. But, but if you go out into anywhere that the people have gravel roads in the bush, they have those snorkels up there. Now, there are snorkels for water. Mm-hmm. as well so you can drive your vehicle into water but the ones in australia are primarily there for dust are you making that up no, no. what car do you drive in the water land rover off-road land rover will go you can actually have water inside the cab and it'll still function why would you want to do that though? because there are fords and rivers <laughs> and lakes that you have to drive across when you're a farmer and you have to rescue your sheep from the top of the mountain you sometimes you have to drive drive through water Megan's, I, I Megan's like, as long as they have food <laughs> delivery wherever I'm going, as long as Postmates will work wherever I am, I'm happy. I've never used them. 
Uh, you clearly, clearly not been on I the am way adventure. too cheap to order food that I could get in my car and go pick up myself. <laughs> you see? They, that's how you do it. But that's... Uh, so they have this Mazda um, Mazda truck out there that looks awesome. They have Mercedes trucks out there that I saw. I've never seen one of those in the wild before. Um, of course, there's lots of Toyota TRDs and Land Cruisers and that sort of thing. But everything out there is much more rugged and much more sort of manly and beefy. And you have the Isuzu. Yeah, they have Zuzu trucks out there. Mm, Suzuki's still big out there. Isn't yeah. it surprising when you think that the car company's gone and you go overseas and there they are? Well, they're not gone. Well, I know. They're just gone from the United States. We vanquished them. I saw an Isuzu in Thailand and I couldn't believe it. Right. I, thought, I thought that hit, car company had been gone a decade. No, no. They, it's like Suzuki. You thought that car company would be gone a that, decade, but they, they still sell all over the world except the United States. That MUX is cute. The yeah. Isuzu MUX. Have you seen that? Yeah. Well, they have of course lots of really, have. really sexy cars. <laughs> Why did I ask? All right, coming up, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the new Audi A7 with Brian Armistead. That's on our Auto Expert. We want to stay just where you are. You're listening to our Auto Expert. So I have to tell you that Megan just completely ruined my trip to uh, Australia. Why? Because you, you ate kangaroo and yeah. I hadn't fed them. Uh. I, we hand fed them too. I'm, so, I'm devastated. So one of my best friends lives in Australia, and when we got to it her, wouldn't be my friend if they ate kangaroo. I know. So when we got back to her house, so we we drove the Great Ocean Road, and they have this um, like animal sanctuary where you can feed the kangaroos, and so we stopped and then eat them. So we stopped along our road trip and fed them, and it was magical. I mean, it was really an incredible experience. And then we get back to the house, and she's just like, "I have kangaroo sausage." I was like, "What?" So we ate it. Like I I don't feel good about the fact that we did that, but. I would, you know what? I would be crying myself to sleep at night. Well, I mean, you eat other stuff, don't you? No. You don't I'm eat... very picky. I wouldn't even eat shellfish because it tastes like someone blew their nose in a shell. Well, I agree with that. <laughs> I don't eat seafood, but. <laughs> and I don't, eat, I don't mind eating salmon and that sort of thing. But... I mean, we only had like a couple bites. And what was funny is she's lived in Australia her whole life. And that was the first time she ever ate kangaroo. Really? So I guess some people eat them, but for the most part, you wouldn't. I don't feel bad about eating alligator, though. I don't know why. Alligator's so chewy, it's just not that good. It is. I've never had it. They off, They told us we could have had it. I was but, up in um, the Londier Lund- region of Montreal or <laughs> Quebec. Yeah. Like kind of in the middle of nowhere. And they took me to a bison farm. And they made me eat bison pate and elk pate. Well, pate's and I, never bad. Though. I almost tossed my cookies. <laughs> really? I don't know. There's just something mental about it. Like, I'm a very picky eater. Like uh, if it's somewhat strange i don't eat any game yeah if it's somewhat strange i won't eat it well and so I, I don't know what it was but like we had just visited the bisons like you go through a museum you learn all about them and then you watch them out on the oh. and then and then we went in to where they sell the bison meat and they're like here try it i was like oh i don't feel good about that we just visited them yeah that i'm very weak when it comes to that sort of thing I'm very weak when it comes to uh, weird foods. I'm trying to think if we've eaten anything weird on our trips together. I feel like... No, we wouldn't have because I won't eat I anything I feel like weird. on our next trip, that's, what's, that's no, what I'm going to arrange. I, I will You're more than happily stuff. Facebook you eating weird stuff and the disgusting look on your face. Interestingly enough, one of my things... Well, we're obviously in Australia to drive this new Hyundai venue. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that I asked, I said, what is a typical Australian cuisine? What's a dish? And they don't have any. And the reason they don't have any is because the Aborigines used to uh, forage for their food. So they would uh, hunt and forage. They would kill it, cook it over a fire, and just eat the fruit or berries or whatever it came with. They didn't farm. You know, they have that's no farming so interesting. Culture. You know, when we were in the Whit Sundays, we never went out to eat because it was so expensive. We got groceries and cooked right. them in the room. Like, we stayed at these different, like, I don't know what kind of hotel you stayed in, but we stayed in, like, RV type hotels with these cabins so we could spread out and cook our own meals. Right. Is that what y'all did? No, or? we were in a five star hotel. Oh yeah. gosh, yeah, I wasn't. I was traveling with kids. We were in the. Uh, I mean, the food was great, family. but they don't. They adopt the only dish we could find that they have in Australia, which is unique to Australia, is called a pea floater. What does that mean? Not what you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's a pie that floats inside a sort of a pea mush soup, and so they the pie sits in the middle, and then they it's like a meat. Well, wait, pie. isn't that what they're known for? Is their meat pies? Well, that's an English thing. See, it's adopted from the English culture. Okay. Well, when we were in Melbourne, the food is amazing. It's colorful. It's creative. It's over the top. Like, 
Like, but it's all it adopted a, from another culture. It's a beautiful piece of art. Like, I mean, you're eating like a masterpiece at every meal. As long as it doesn't taste of paint, I'm good. No, it tastes amazing. Okay, good. Uh, Brian Armistead's on the phone joining us to talk about the new Audi A7. So, uh, Brian, I noticed Audi sales a couple of months ago that the A6 and the A7 are their best-selling vehicles still in the world, and there's a reason for that. Uh, it's a good reason. First of all, welcome back, Nick. Sounds like you were just on an epic journey to Australia, so welcome back. I did have an epic um, journey, but I brought a virus back with me, unfortunately. You did what? I brought a virus back with me. Oh, I'm sorry. Is it called koala bear virus, something like that? I mean, yes. Oh, you did touch that koala. I did touch a koala bear. And they Could tell you a... not to touch them. No, they, they allowed us to touch them, but only on the bum. Apparently, I only touch yeah. it on the bum, mate. Just touch it on the bum right there. Yeah, that's it. Touch it right there, mate. It's good. Go that's ahead. pretty good, Nick. Well, at least, at least you understood what they were saying, you know, because good speaking, honestly speaking, not too far off the off the mark there. No, we're just um, we're just yeah, not I mean, criminals like the Australians. Criminals. True, 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 true. <laughs> I mean, the whole country was based on you know a bunch of criminals, Dan. I mean, you know, so and uh, only if, if only if they uh, could if the U.S. could adopt their uh, their lifestyle now. I mean, you know. Found by a bunch of criminals now. We're run by a bunch of criminals. I, I, ha- them. I have to tell you, my favorite, my favorite fact about Australia is the first police force in Australia was made up of the least offensive criminals. That's right. awesome. Is there a point exactly. system for yeah, that? Yeah, I know. Point, <laughs> some kind of point system. All right. Back to what we were talking about, the Audi A7. So uh, it's, it's one of the two best-selling Audis in the country. And for good reason, this car is fantastic. First of all, you know, Audi was probably the second that were third in line uh, with this whole coupe, four-door coupe concept. Nissan Maxima was the first with their four-door sports car. They don't get any credit for that because Mercedes came out with CLS, and then Audi came out with this A7. You know, they call them four-door coupes. There's no such thing as a four-door coupe, but it has a coupe swoopy kind of profile to it. So if that's what works for you in terms of marketing, so be it. I will tell you that this car has more headroom than most of these uh, swoopy configurations. Although I'm too tall to sit in the back, most people under six foot four, six foot three would do just fine. But I've got tons of legroom, Nick and Jen. I mean, I can literally stretch out. It's a great highway cruiser. And you're gigantic. Yes. Yeah. How tall are you? By the way, we have Megan on the air too today. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, no offense, I, but I, you're. He is. Much you should see. You should I see. Am. You should see Brian and I hug. It's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. <laughs> I have seen you hug. I didn't yeah. really. That's that's not it's, how. It's I, photographic. Yeah. <laughs> uh oh. So I can't give Brian any hugs at all. No, then. You, see, see, I I'm come up. I I'm six foot nine, Jen. Okay, I'm. You're six almost foot nine. Four foot. I told you. I mean, five foot. <laughs> You're almost four foot. <laughs> I've been five foot. <laughs> so five foot is probably about your waist, isn't it, Brian? Yeah, pretty much. Okay, so that's not going to (laughs) work. I have three press cars. Uh, For some reason, I kind of screwed up my schedule. So I have a Ford Raptor and a a Genesis uh, G70, which is a a terrific car. But, you know, I keep gravitating towards this A7 every time I come out of my house because it's got everything. It's got comfort. It's got style. It's got quattro all-wheel drive. You know, here in Maryland, we get some pretty uh, funky weather, even when it's not snowing. It doesn't snow heavily like the uh, northern states, but um, you know we get a, a fair share of rain. And the Quattro all-wheel drive is really a tried-and-true package. 68.8 for the A7 Quattro. I've got the Sportline package. Came to 83.240 after you ticked off a bunch of boxes, including the $8,300 Prestige package, which includes the MMI navigation with touch response, a 10.1-inch screen, the Audi virtual cockpit. If you haven't experienced this, then you must. I've got to be honest. Pages. You're using a lot of super so, technical words, and I'm not exactly <laughs> sure what you're come talking on, Megan. about. Come on, Megan. It's easy. Yeah. It's, MMI is the little rotating dial in the middle. I did not know that. Really? Okay. You're talking about where you go from drive to park? To no, that's the yeah, no, no, no. What rotating dial. dial. MMI, next day, they've actually gotten rid of uh, the uh, rotating dial for, for this year. Now it's all touch and sweet. See, aren't you glad I brought that up? You didn't know. He did yeah, not know. No, it's, it's a good point because the MMI interface used to be a rotary controller. And now it's all touch screen. It's got a really nice haptic feel. So when you press on a source, you kind of get a little click under your finger. And you know that you've gone to from one source to another. I like using voice controls because sometimes, you know, when you don't have that dial anymore, I kind of had become dependent on the dial. And now that it's not there... 
I don't want to have to look at the screen to figure out what I'm doing. So I just use Audi's uh, voice control, which is superb. I can go from XM channel, Series XM channel, from one to another. I can switch to, um, to um, my uh, Apple CarPlay. I want to listen to Pandora or some YouTube uh, music. So it's, it's really uh, kind of the next best thing. That sounds amazing, but if you have an accent, voice yeah. control is not usually your friend. I was going to tell you. Oh, but no, you can, you, can tailor, <laughs> you can tailor these things for different accents. Do they, they have a southern? Up, they, are, they have a fuzzy logic, so they will adapt to your voice. What? So like when Nick says aluminum, they'll know that he's <laughs> Aluminum? Aluminum. You know, even though he yeah. said it wrong, you know? That's my bane. That's the bane of my existence is trying to talk to car. And, you know, I'll say, uh, show show a Starbucks near my location. It goes tuning to channel one twenty. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like call mom. Like, no, that's I said go to Target. Yeah, no, it, it so does. The Audi A seven has the uh, three liter fuel uh, injection engine, and, and you know to translate that, it gets up and goes. It's a turbocharged injected engine and it really gets up and goes quite nicely that's quite exciting properly, i might add uh all season tires custom wheels the s-line package adds trim that kind of puts it almost to rs status but not quite there so you don't get any performance upgrades but you get a lot of styling upgrades inside you have beautiful open pore wood and it melts beautifully with aluminum trim this is real aluminum because it's cold in the morning we're having chilly mornings here in the uh, in maryland now We've got perforated leather seats that are heated and cooled, and I had to kind of race to get over here, so I raced on my uh, Mercedes SL convertible, and I jumped in this car so I could have my uh, the stickler in front of me so I could get d- data, and um, it cooled off very quickly, even though it's like 90 degrees here in Maryland today, so uh, hats off to Audi for a very, very nice uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. I do love it's a ventilated seat. Right. Ventilated seats. They're actually air conditioned seats. They're not ventilated like oh. in my Mercedes. I have an older Benz, a 2009 SL63, which has ventilated seats. These are actually cooled seats. And they use some kind of a uh, transducer to actually put a little small air conditioning kind of feel in, in the seats. And it's that, really quite, uh, quite amazing. That is different. I did not realize there was a difference. Yeah, there's, uh, and you know something? Ventilated seats are great because they're in cooled seats basically just stops the, you know, you sweating so much. Ventilated seats stops you sweating completely, mm. especially right. on hot leather. That's what I need. Okay, these are cooled and ventilated. It's got uh, the Google Maps. Um, so if you're in the virtual cockpit and you have a destination that you want to go to, it will, you will actually see physical maps of where you're going so you'll see the buildings so you know you'll see the topography but does it work with an iphone does it work with an iphone absolutely okay yeah so so the the google earth is what you're talking about right brian where you actually see a satellite view of uh of the where you're actually driving and when you pull up you can actually see oh yeah that's the building i was looking at right here yeah Yeah. that's what i'm looking for like it shows you a picture of the actual building Oh, that the is actual, very the fancy. Google Earth image of where you are. It's, it's pretty amazing. Like, if I were to pull up, um, it doesn't do it in every single location. But if, if, if Google has mapped that location and it's tied into this Audi MMI system, multimedia interface system, then it will show you, like, if I go down to the Washington Mall, for example, I'll see the various Smithsonian Institution museums on the Washington Mall as I drive past them. Oh, yes, that's the Air and Space Museum. I recognize the pictures of it. Oh, yes, that's the Museum of Natural History. I see. That's the one with the uh, blue the blue well inside. Which museum elephant. is your favorite? Uh, oh, Air and Space. Like, yeah, it is course. pretty well done. <laughs> does this? Yeah. I'm, does... I'm a kind of a tech guy. You know, cars, planes, boats, all that kind of stuff really kind of turns me on. So, uh, yeah, Air and Space for, by a long shot. And does the one that you're driving, uh, Brian, have the uh, rear spo- adaptive rear spoiler? It does not have the adaptive wrist ball. That's my favorite part. Ah, the rear. Yeah, you know, but you know. <laughs> and I mean, this, this thing is not really... If, if, if you want a car that's built for speed, then RS7 is the one right. that you want to go for. Right. Now, I will say that uh, Audi is coming out with their RS6 Abad six-speed wagon, which is just going to sell out immediately. Next, going to flip like out. Yeah. If it's a wagon, I'm in. But is it diesel? It is. <laughs> <laughs> they won't have a diesel. <laughs> AudiUSA.com. Brian, thank you so much for uh, joining us on the show. We'll talk to you again soon. Take care, my friend. And previous episodes of the show at OurAutoExpert.com. 
You've been listening to Our Auto Expert with Nick Mile. Find all the show episodes at ourautoexpert.com. Please follow us on all social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Our Auto Expert. And message us for a quick and witty response. 